This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. He specializes in family law, wills, and estates for flame fans in Calgary and Southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187 and mention Fireside Chat to get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, here we are, and the entry draft is over, and once again, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're bringing you Flames Hockey, and Matt, I don't know about you, it always feels weird to me when it's end of June and we're talking hockey again. Oh, it's always the fun and exciting part of the year for me, because this is where you get to see how the team's going to be built for the the following season. It's definitely exciting. It's one of my favorite episodes of the season, but it's just like I'm sitting here in shorts and talking hockey. Well, didn't it snow in Alberta, like? yesterday or the day before briefly so you know it's still hockey adjacent weather i won't out anybody because i don't think fans probably need to know but uh, you probably remember a couple years ago at the uh, rookie camp one of the tv reporters came with his suit and tie on the top and shorts and flip-flops on the bottom yeah that's summer hockey for you oh definitely um but anyway let's uh jump to the yeah or if we were covering the florida panthers yeah, even then, I don't know. I I don't think you would dress like that. You'd probably get you know suit shorts made. Just get your tailor to crop them up. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what they do down there. Probably yeah. lots of linen suits. Look like Colonel Sanders. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about uh, what's going on with the Flames this week. We'll get to the draft, but before we do, we should acknowledge Mark Giordano, our captain, the Calgary Flames' first ever Norris Trophy winner. And this thing that you and I have been talking about for most of the season that he was going to win. Some people thought, you know, sometimes there's a bias towards the East. But if Gio didn't win this, I think it would have confirmed that Eastern bias. That was the right man for the trophy. Yeah, there really was no other choice. And he did nearly get all of the vote, which would have been the first time in like 30 years or something like that. So, yeah, it was rather impressive and... Good for Mark Giordano to become the first undrafted player to win the Norris Trophy since uh, some kind of irrelevant guy, uh, number four Bobby Orr in 1975. I've heard of him. Yeah. Uh, But he was came into the league before there was a draft anyway, so it's kind of a little disingenuous there, but technically... So for those that don't know, the Norris Trophy is the NHL's trophy named after James Norris, and it's awarded to the defense player who demonstrates throughout the season the greatest all-around ability in the position. Um, And yeah, I mean, if you look at Gio, we didn't go too far in the playoffs, but during the regular season, he definitely was that guy. Yeah, well, if you were basing it off the playoffs, uh, I don't think that Tampa would have won any awards at the draft. No, (laughs) for sure. Yeah. Because, yeah. <clears throat> and we we saw the lists of uh, of players. I don't have them in front of me here, but we saw the nominee list after. And at, what was it? I think uh, our coach was like fourth or fifth for uh, Jack Adams. We had some guys that were 10 and 11 for other awards. So, you know, while we only really won one, good showing for the Flames, I think. Yeah, Gaudreau was fourth for the MVP. So, uh, by and large, you know, and, and that's... Uh, Something to build part- on. Yeah, well, it's part of being one of the elite teams in the league is that you have players that get nominated for awards. Yeah, you're right. And, I mean, you look at the last couple even Norris winners here, like Vector Hedman last year is 27 when he won it. Uh, Brent Burns was 33. Drew Doughty, uh, 29 when he won it. Like Mark Giordano, definitely the oldest guy. And I think that Giordano's 35. I think to me, what Gio did would be impressive either way, but I think at his age, that's really what gave him such a sweep in the voting. Yeah, and it's it's sort of like when Nick Lidstrom won his first Norris Trophy, because I think he was like 33 or something like that when he won his first one, and it's like, yeah, you're due for one. Yeah. So, good for the captain. But uh, outside of that, there hasn't been much we should talk about this week. Yeah, it's been a rather light... You know, because of the salary cap not being declared, it kind of threw a wrench into all the trades that would have normally happened. But even outside of that, we've still got, what, five new Calgary Flames. Yep. So, 
let's uh, let's start at in Vancouver at the entry draft. We talked last week about those picks. The Flames did not make a move, so all the picks we talked about last week are the picks they're still picking with. Um, they had their tw- number twenty six, number eighty eight, number one sixteen, one fifty, and two fourteen. So, Matt, let's look at these. Our first-round pick, the number 26, was one of the guys you really liked that we talked about, Uh, Jacob Peltier from the Moncton Wildcats of the QMJHL. 18 years old, um, 5'9", 161 pounds. This is a guy who's really seen by a lot as a really good offensive player, and we know that the Flames haven't been shy of picking young guys. If you listen to what GM Treliving has been saying about this guy, is the Flames aren't going out there looking for certain size or anything like that they're looking for guys as he said that have the compete level yeah and that's what you need and like you see with how this past season broke down in the playoffs having players with that enthusiasm to and compete level that that can make the difference between what happened and you know going on further and you know, especially with how this postseason happened, like the Flames should have won that first round series, but they were out competed by Colorado, and that's what happened. And Pel- Peltier is a very competitive guy. In his interview with the team, he said that uh, he was asked, uh, Why should we pick you at 26? And he said, Because I will win the Stanley Cup. And that's the kind of attitude that you're looking for. Uh, he's favorably compared to guys like Marchand and Brendan Gallagher, which uh, having another person to go with Kachuk on his friendship tour would also be very nice. And additionally, he's also a very good defensive forward, which that also helps. So some of the sort of quotes out there that I saw during draft week from uh, EP Rinkside, rinkside.com said Peltier is a highly skilled offensive player with good vision, a high-end shot, and creativity with the puck on his stick. Future considerations said offensively, he's very opportunistic, and if he smells a scoring chance, he seems to have an extra gear and killer instinct. McKean's Hockey said he's heavy on the forecheck and finishes his checks. His forechecks and backcheck, he forechecks and backchecks with zest. That's not a word I've ever heard about a hockey player before. He's zesty. That's know, right. Like, yeah. Isn't that a soap zest? Yeah, I think so. Um, and then I, ISS uh, said about him a couple years ago in 2017, creative playmaking forward, good speed, natural playmaker, likes to carry the puck, very good vision, shifty with the puck. So I th- it sounds like we're getting a guy that really could become an all-arounder here. I think if any Flames fans are expecting him to turn – pro this year maybe but if you're looking at him to even make the nhl roster this is a guy who the team has already said is a couple years out it's a jankowski like pick in that respect oh i wouldn't even go that far i think it's more like dylan dubé where like two years in juniors and then you know yeah see where he's probably a more fair comparison yeah but uh he's still a little on the small side at five nine one sixty uh he'll probably be around 180 when he give or take a bit when he actually makes the nhl and to me seeing him like if his offense doesn't translate he'll be a very effective third liner in the same manner that sam bennett is um if his offense does translate he could be a second or potentially a first line forward well i think that's what's great about this guy he has a lot of tools and we can sort of pick and choose which ones we really want him to focus on yeah it just depends on him, basically. His upside is as good as anyone in the draft. It's just, will he get the, those breaks to further his game to reach the levels that he can get to? It, it, I'm always a fa- favored when drafting in the first round to go with the highest upside guys possible, and Peltier and Hoaglander were number one, number two on my list. Um actually Hoaglander had first but um for that very reason that uh, I thought that their upside was as high as you know for any realistic guys that were around where we were picking so getting Pelte a plus in my books 
Yeah, good pick. I mean, another small guy, but Calgary's done well with those. And I think this is a guy who, from everything that we've seen, um, does really have a, a great, you know, a great skill set. I think the Dylan Dubé comparison is probably a better one. That yeah, he'll probably stay in junior. They will probably want him to be the big fish in a small pond after you get eighty nine points and sixty. What was it? Sixty uh, two games, I think. Yeah, sixty five yeah. games. So put him back in the yeah. queue for a year. That's a great dev league too, and I think you'll yeah. learn more there than if they turn him pro right away. Yeah, and also in the queue uh, since two thousand five, they're in or two thousand four. Uh, for players in their draft minus one year, so when their player's 17, uh, there have been four players that have been a point per game it, during that year. Uh, the first one was Sidney Crosby. Uh, the second was Angelo Esposito, who got derailed due to a lot of knee injuries. Uh, the third was Nathan McKinnon, and then the fourth was Jacob Peltier. So, so quite he good does have... Yeah, and when you're talking all of those years of prospects coming through and he's one of four guys and you know it, like it, it's one of those where the sky's the limit for him and we'll we just have to wait and see how he shakes out but this could be a home run pick this is a guy i'm really excited to see at rookie camp same here as excited as i was for like guys like a chuck or Gaudreau or monahan yeah and this is a guy i expect even if you don't know which one he is you'll be able to tell just, and you and I have seen that a few times, like which prospect is it? I don't know. Look for the best one. Like I think looking at last year's roster and looking at the guys that have been added, he should stand out head over heels among everybody else. Yeah. I would be shocked if he wasn't number one. Um, let's go to the next pick the flames had. They didn't pick in the second round. They weren't able to recoup that pick like we thought they were going to. Uh, so their next pick was number 88, which was in the third round. And they went and got Ilya Nikolaev. Is that right? Nikolai Nikolaev. Nikolaev. Uh, he's 17. He's a Russian. There's always that. Um, there's always that uncertainty with Russian players who are playing overseas. But Flames use their 88th uh, overall pick on him. He, it's been said about this guy that he has some solid gains on his form. He plays with a buzz and has high energy pacing to his game. Uh, he is a little bit bigger. He's six foot, 190 pounds, uh, shoots left and plays center. And this past season, uh, most of his time was spent in the uh, MHL in Russia. And he played 41 games, got 20, 25 points there. So not, you know, not as known a player, but obviously that's why he's in the third round. Um, I was kind of surprised we took another forward so early, but what do you think of this pick? Oh, he was rated... Uh as being like either a late first round pick or uh mid like down to a mid second round like around 50th international anywhere, scouting but, services had him at 28 and uh mckeen's had him at 61 so quite a variation there yeah and i think that he fell largely just due to the russian factor and he is under contract in the khl for two years so don't expect him over here anytime soon but he, if he pans out, we basically had got a second first round pick with our third round pick. And if he doesn't, well, you tried. And he's got all the tools that you would expect from a late first round pick. It's just that the off the ice things are what dropped him to 88. And the Flames, if you look at it, drafting Russians, we haven't had a great track record recently of having those Russians want to come over. No, but you got to keep trying, and hopefully one day we get somebody who's really good out of it. So, and you know what? At a th at uh, you know eighty eight, I think it's a it's an okay pick. Yeah, because you know you're getting basically a guy who, like, if he was drafted, say thirtieth overall. I don't think anyone would have batted an eye. So, you know, to get that guy at 88, yeah, okay, sure, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you no, know, it's... It, it's just like uh, when Shillington fell down to, like, 60 and the Flames were able to pick him up. It's like, yeah, well, he could have been a... It, if you'd picked him at 15, that wouldn't have been the worst pick in the world. So, I think that's a good way to look at it. It's almost like Anderson Shillington, where if they pan out... 
you're going to get more than you bargained for, and we're already seeing that with Anderson, I think. If he doesn't pan out, well, you know, no harm, no foul. Yeah. Uh, the next guy that the Flames picked was in round four. They used the 116th pick, 116, and they drafted a Swede, a Swede Lucas Fuke, who's 18, out of Stockholm. He's six foot one, 185 pounds, plays center and left, shoots left, and I hate pronouncing Swedish team names, um, so I'm not even going to try, but uh, this past season he... He played in the Swedish Elite League um, and put up some okay numbers there. Not a ton. Um, what, do, what do you know about this guy, Matt? What are Flames fans going to see? Uh, he's an all-around offensive guy. Um, uh, I've heard he's... that he has really good stick handling. Yeah, he's just very inconsistent. And that's why he's 116. Yeah. Um, if he was consistent, he probably would have been an early second-round pick. It, and he has that level of ability. It's just that you don't know what you're getting from shift to shift, game to game. It's very much the same type of pick as the Ruzitska pick, where the guy's got all the talent in the world. He just has to figure out how to do it every game, every shift. I was tweeting with a fan in Sweden, and he had an interesting analysis of this guy. He said he is very one-dimensional in, in that he almost reminded this fan of Jerome McGinley where you see him a lot in the offensive zone, but he can almost become a liability in his own zone. And like you said, that's part of the reason you dropped a fourth usually. Um, but that's on the flames probably have to work on with this guy. Yeah. And he's one of those guys where like, especially like what my philosophy with the draft is, is get the guys that have the highest skill levels possible and hope to hell that you can figure out how to fix the problems. And Fuke is a very good player with a lot of problems. And if they can figure out a way to get him to keep his good parts and fix or minimize as much as possible the weak parts, then they might have a good player out of the deal. Or he'd be an AHLer for a couple of years and then go away. Yeah, so he, I mean, you know, the Swedish league is a league where you're, it's, I'm, I'm trying to kind of put it into comparison for fans. It's a pretty good league. It's not great. Um, they have a J20 league, which is sort of their junior league, and that's where he played most of the year. Um, and in 43 games, he had 43 points. So point a game there, that probably equates to, I'd say, about a half point generally in the Canadian leagues. Uh, no, it's... Uh... In their J20 like, league, not the Super yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's more like uh, two-thirds a point per game. Okay, so take. so still, you know, pretty good offense there, but probably needs some work. For, like you said, they can work with him, and uh, he's going to need some work before he translates to, uh, to the NHL. Yeah, you just have to hope that the problems in his game get worked on. But with him being a Swedish prospect, it's likely three or four years before – that's even a concern so we'll and see w and with him not being russian i expect he will be at rookie camps so the flames will get to work with him right away yeah i don't think our russian from round two will come to rookie camp i'd be somewhat pleasantly surprised but uh, me yeah, too I, but how often in the past has the gm told us oh this russian couldn't get a visa that russian couldn't get a visa yeah uh, and that brings us down to pick number 150 um this was the next flames pick in round five of the draft and they used this one to come back to North America, and they took uh, Josh Nodler, who last year played for Michigan State in the NCAA. He's 18, uh, a U.S. player from Oak Park, uh, M M Missouri, I think, Michigan. I'm not sure. One of the two. Um, no. He's six foot, 196 pounds, so a heavier player than the last couple. And he's listed as playing forward. I've heard he can sort of play all around the ice. He didn't actually play in the NCAA last year. He's committed to going to uh, Michigan State. But he actually played for Fargo Force of the USHL, where he played 54 games, had 17 goals, 25 assists for 42 total points. Um, not a lot out there about this kid. What do you know about him? Uh, he's a very raw player. and Most guys this pick are. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of offensive skill. But it, it's one of those guys where you dump him in the NCAA, you wait four years, and you hope that he's put things together. Uh, you, 
you know, you draft about 15 of these guys, you might get one that turns into a dynamite NHL player. And, you know, it's just a roll of the dice. He, It's just like uh, guys that we drafted last year in a similar manner. Um, you just, they have upside. You just wait and see. And, you know, see how they do next year with the NCAA. Um Ideally, you'd have more than 20 points next year in the NCAA, and you you go from there. I talked to a guy who goes to Fargo games. He, I was tweeting with him. He said there's flashes of brilliance with this guy where he looks like he could be the best player on the ice, but more often than not, he said he doesn't have great hockey sense. He's often out of position or not you know, quite checking the right guy a lot of times. So he said, like, sort of like you did, there's some raw talent there. But there's going to be a long-term project. Yeah. This is one of those where it'll go the full four years. I'd be shocked if he is signs before then. And, you know, you just have to wait and see and hope that things get figured out. And those flashes of brilliance are what you're actually getting instead of the rest of his game. If the Flames were not to sign any of the five... Nodler would be the one that I'd expect them to just let go at the end of it. Yeah, I agree. And we talked last week about your old analogy of should the, or not analogy, but I guess your rule, uh, should the Flames draft a goaltender every year? And you and I agreed this is probably the year that you didn't need a goalie. Uh, I guess Tree Living didn't listen to our show on the plane on the way to Vancouver because he drafted a goalie. He used our last pick in the draft, uh, round seven, number 214. And he went ahead and got Dustin Wolf, who is with the Everett Silver Tips, uh, playing there last year. He had 61 games. Uh, his goals against was 1.69 and 0.936 save percentage in the regular season. He's 18, uh, from California, six foot, 161 pound goaltender. I haven't got a lot of chance to see this guy. Uh, what do you know about him? Well, Carter Hart used to play for Everett, and when he went to the World Juniors, uh, Wolf took over, and he played well. And yeah. Everett's got a good system there, too. Yeah, and then he took over this year because, of course, Hart graduated and is now at the Flyers, and Wolf played amazing, frankly. I'm actually somewhat shocked that he fell to round seven because, like, well, I've seen... that makes you wonder why, too. Like, that was the first thing I thought, too. I'm like, huh, round seven. What don't we know about the kid? Well, I've seen some uh, places list his height as 5'10", which that would make sense. You know, because, you know, the NHL goalies, the, the, you know, a lot of teams don't like guys that are under six feet. And so if he's only 5'10", then you know, that would make some sense because, like, even UC Soros, who should have been a first-round pick for Nashville, ended up sliding down to the fourth, and he's looking like the next big goaltender prospect coming up. So, we'll see. Um, this is the guy that I'm curious, most curious about of the five players, just to see what he's like in person. Um, and I would imagine we will see him in July at rookie camp. Yeah. And uh, I'm expecting, uh, like, I'll be definitely commenting on his height in, when I see him in person because you can tell a Are lot you easier. Are going to bring a measuring stick? Uh, well, my day job, I'm used to using my eye for measurements. So, you know, it, it's easy to tell. So, you know, you can tell when somebody's under six foot. This is the, like you said, this is the pick to me that could be the real wild card here. And I'm glad the Flames didn't use a high pick on a goalie because we've done that with, I'd say, limited success recently. But, um, yeah, I think if Wolf can turn out and look like he is in the dub and what I've heard he looks like in the dub, and you've confirmed that, this guy could be a really great pick for this team. Yeah, this was the kind of guy that, I like if the Flames were to pick a goalie, this was the specific player I was hoping for. But you know, like yeah, right. I I didn't expect you know with his numbers, I actually expected him to go in the third or fourth round to some team that needed a goalie. So like the fact that he was there at seven, it's like it's a no brainer to me. Yeah. Like like this guy could become a starting goaltender in the NHL. Yeah, you know. I had. I have a feeling that if we look at the uh, at the draft, I think Peltier is definitely somebody that the Flames are going to have for a while. I have a feeling that our number 88 pick 
isn't going to come to North America. I don't think 116 and 150 are going to pan out. So I think when we look back as fans, we're going to remember this, the year we got Peltier and Wolf to sandwich a bunch of guys that we never saw again. That was my impression as well. Nikolaev is just a bit of a wild card, so we'll see. Uh, he could be a good player. but I, I, yeah. I'm not doubting he'll probably be a good player. I just don't know if he'll be a good player in a Calgary Flames jersey. Yeah. Um, well, maybe maybe the fact the Flames are one of the elite teams might entice him to come. Maybe. He's also a winger, too, and you got to look at how much. We'll see by the time he gets here. Because we have, what, four years with NCAA and four years for Russians, right? Uh, something like that. Unless they're a defected player, in which case you just hold their rights indefinitely. Yeah. So he could definitely, uh, yeah, he, we could definitely see him come in later then. I don't think we'd have room for him in two years, but three or four, I maybe. We'll yeah. see. Yeah, it just depends. Yeah, but I, I'm, again, my guts just tell me Peltier and Wolf become the the two pieces that we remember, even if the other guys come over Fuke and Nodler, I don't think we know who they are. They'll be, you know, AHL, ECHL filler guys, a Brett Pollock type. Yeah. And that, unless they surprise, and that's like with a lot of the flames picks last year where like where they're currently trending is AHL guys. Uh, a couple of them might, make the nhl but you know it, that long shots basically and that's what happens when you don't pick in the first round frankly so you know it, with peltier you're kind of expecting him to make the nhl and especially with his makeup he should more than most uh 26 overall picks but we'll see well and as you and i have discussed as well you know there's nothing wrong with a guy who can make a living playing pro hockey even at the hl level i mean you know, we need filler guys in the AHL, and not everybody can be an NHLer. So even if these guys can trend to being everyday AHLers, it's a pretty, uh, you know, still respectable hockey career. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, like this is also part of the reason why I like drafting players in the later rounds that have skill, because even if they, they themselves don't turn out, they're good enough as players that you they can help facilitate the development of other players. Because, like, if you're trying to pass the puck and the other guy doesn't know how to accept it properly or can't pass it back, well... Well, if then you can't accept it, a pass, hopefully you're not getting to the NHL draft. Yeah. Yeah, well, we've seen some of our prospects <laughs> in the past be like that. So, you know, um, so having some guys that have some skill that can play, like legit play, that will help for anybody who actually is talented, at, like towards the NHL level, talented, to have guys that they can play with. So one way or another, it's useful to draft with, guys with skill more than anything so looking at these picks matt uh the five picks the flames had just looking at those five any surprises there anybody look at and go huh what a you know what an odd choice uh no the, uh, basically this draft reminded me a lot of last year's draft where the flames just went out and took skill above all else and you know let the chips fall where they may Peltier has the best blend of skills, and like frankly, if he wasn't hurt towards the end of the season, I think that he probably would have went 12th or 13th instead of 26th, but he had a really bad playoffs due to an ankle injury. So, you know, it, hopefully Peltier turns out to be that good, and like we get like a added higher level prospect out of the deal, and the rest, it, it's a wait and see. The thing they, that surprises me is there's no defenseman taken. Uh, yes and no. Um, frankly, looking at the four players that forwards that the Flames drafted, uh, there was no real defensemen that were taken shortly thereafter that made any sense to me to go over the player that we took, and. Yeah, it sucks that because we do need defensemen, but we also have four guys that are in the NHL right now under the age of 22 as defensemen. So it's like, yeah, we could use some more guys, but if for a year or two we're not 
really adding much to the pipeline. Is it that big a deal? Eh, you know. And I would actually kind of expect that maybe perhaps some of the walk-on defensemen that we see next week or the week after, uh, those guys uh, will get spots in so the NHL. talking a lot of like the college free agents they bring into the rookie camp. Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked if a cup, any of the standouts there get inked right away. And yeah, this is one of those times where the Flames just kind of need to find any talent anywhere that they can and hope that something hits and it, well, again, not, go, it, back, go back to this year's Norris trophy winner right undrafted uh went to another training camp before he came to ours like not a guy that was expected to take the path he did and look what we got out of him yeah exactly and just you know and i'm sure that the flames probably have already contacted like every undrafted defenseman saying come to calgary and you know let's see what you got and we have a lot of opportunities right now and calgary can possibly walk away with a couple of defensemen out of the freebie bin and it's not the end of the world because of the fact that we have four really young defensemen if we're stuck without you know, because, like, I'm not really expecting uh, Hamannick, Brody, or Giordano to get moved, necessarily. So, like, and perhaps And I think they'll Brody. fill some of that AHL depth with some uh, veteran pieces come July as well. Yeah, so, like, it's one of those where, like, there's no real urgent need that, oh, we must get, you know, top prospect defensemen. It's just one of those weird things that like i don't think the flames really anticipated hitting with all four of the young guys that they have you know like hannafin yes but you know having the other three play as well as they did this season i don't think anybody would have really anticipated that so it, it's great it's just that you know it, it gives the flames options to do other things like try to get additional high skill forwards so Outside of a couple trades that uh, were made, as we know, P.K. Subban got shipped, Marlowe got shipped. Um, are you surprised that the Flames didn't end up making a deal? You and I talked last week about probably having a goaltender leave, maybe having Gillies leave. Are you surprised that, I mean, every draft Trill Living's been in, he's made some sort of a deal. Are you surprised that we saw nothing from Tree? Well, the, th the thing I always look at is, does the deal make sense? And... You know, you're not you you're not doing your job responsibly if you're making a deal to just make a deal. And if like say you want to move TJ Brody for a forward and you're getting offered nothing but third line guys that you've already got like 15 of anyway, are you really going to be enticed to move Brody just for the sake of moving Brody? No, like, you know, worst case scenario, if you have to move him later, you just wait until the trade deadline, you'll probably end up getting a first round pick from some team for him. So, like, it, you know, it, it's just like with Colorado, uh, with Joe Sackick, uh, trying to trade DeShane. And for like a year, practically, he couldn't get the deal that he wanted, and so he sat on him until the right deal came along and it's worked out amazingly for Colorado it, and you know like I'm sure that the Flames would like to make several trades but if you're not getting a, a dance partner that's gonna pay what you're wanting then why make the trade I have a feeling that if the cap uncertainty that we heard about this weekend the salary cap hadn't been where it was we would have got a deal done probably but I think that like teams are now going to just focus more on because now the window to talk to players is open. They'll get a good idea of what the landscape is and like, oh, can I go sign X defenseman because I need a defenseman and these are the four guys that are available, say, if in UFA. You know, and, and none of them want And it feels like leading up to the draft, we also didn't get nearly as many expiring contracts, whether they were rfa or ufa signed as we usually do like i think gms right now are probably really focused on getting their own guys done before they want to take on other people's yeah exactly and it's it's annoying because like as fans you want to see like oh this is the new guys that are coming to the team but calgary also finished 
second in the NHL this past season, and we're likely going to have a better goaltending tandem than we had this past season, just because, frankly, you can't really get much worse than what we had. So the Flames could, you know, even just by standing pat, could end up becoming the best team in the NHL without doing a damn thing. So, you know, we're in a weird situation where we are one of the best teams. So, yeah, you'd like to see some movement, but at the end of the day, does it really make any difference? Like, you know, and, like, if you're making the right moves, like, and I'm sure that the Flames are going to target one of the UFA goalies, and I still wouldn't be shocked if a guy like Cam Talbot came to town well, let's talk about efas in a little bit here yeah um but i think you know we we we're talking about trading guys at the deadline and kind of got off draft or the draft not the deadline we kind of got off track from that i think if the if the cap was where they expected i think more teams would have got deals done and i think that yeah the only reason it didn't was really that cap and i don't think some of these deals are dead I just no. think that some of the things we think might happen, moving out a defenseman, maybe moving a goalie, are going to happen later in the summer once other GMs have figured out what they do or don't have after free agency and then have to make those deals. Yeah, and I wouldn't be shocked if, like, in the next week or so that you, before the July 1st, because with people knowing what all the UFAs are looking for and all that, I wouldn't be shocked if a bunch of trades happen where, like, oh, well, we need this thing and we're not going to be able to get it. We need to trade for it. And yeah, yeah I think that, that, well that I think that's where that will come down. It's just, yeah, it's annoying because that usually happens on the day of the draft. But unfortunately, this year being what it is, it is, you know, it, and we'll just have to wait and see. Like, it, you know, each day just pop up the news and see what what's happening well let's start before we talk about guys that might come in from outside let's talk about the flames getting their own business done four key rfas for the flames this year um i imagine we think that all four of these guys will be signed but let's talk about what we think the deals might look like we'll start with probably the cheapest deal on the list and that's for on andrew mangiapani i i would expect two or three years at like a million million and a half I'm expecting to be sub million. That's possible too. As if the team's at a cap crunch and they're trying to, you know, keep costs down for a guy that really played fourth line most of the year, I bet you see about an eight eight fifty for this guy. Yeah, and it, it would make sense if, like, if you threw the incentive of it being a one way deal, you probably get him for less than a million. Uh, the next one on the list, a player that there's been some talk of potentially moving for a little while now, and that's Sam Bennett. He was current. He was uh, just finishing up a two-year deal at just shy of two million, one point nine five. To me, Bennett hasn't shown a lot of. He's shown some, but not a ton of improvement in his game. How much a raise would you give him? Two and a quarter, maybe. I think two, two and four, a half two, is the most I could go for Bennett. Yeah, yeah, two four, two and a half. I think that would be ideal. I uh, I think a two year deal, uh, like to take him one year before UFA, I think would be fine. And this is a player who I don't see anybody offer sheeting. So even if you don't get done right away, I could see the Bennett deal potentially taking longer into the summer. Yeah, and like realistically, if somebody offers sheets him Let for him like th three and a half or four million, you yeah you take pretty much. Picks. You pretty much just look at the team going, why? Yeah. You know, like, you know, like that seems like a absurdly high Well, that's what I mean. Like, no, nobody's going to give the, the conversation offer sheet a guy who's really a third line, you know, winger at this point. Yeah. It, it would just be more poor form than anything. But, you know, it could happen, but I don't, it, yeah, I don't see it. So um next one is probably so what are you thinking about two and a quarter yeah uh, around there maybe two and two four uh, somewhere in there i think i wouldn't go any higher than two five i think knowing tree and the fact he always tends to get good contracts done i could totally see him coming in at, at exactly two yeah so could i it just depends 
The next one's probably the biggest question mark, and that's Matthew Kachuk. I can see Kachuk wanting to wait and see what Marner gets before he signs anything, or at least Kachuk's people wanting that. Uh, what we, you and I have talked in the past about a seven year, seven million per year deal, seven for seven. Still thinking that's about where we get Kachuk in at. Uh, I'm kind of leaning more towards five at like seven point five ish. Maybe short, th- shorter deal, higher cap hit. Yeah, and uh, why is that? I, uh, just because of stupid contracts like the Hayes contract escalating things. I think that that bumped everybody up quite a bit so interesting yeah that was a really really stupid contract by philadelphia yeah yeah i i I see where you're coming from on that one um i i i don't know i think you could also argue that hayes is an older player um may not be a comparable here are you at all worried that kachuk could get offer sheeted not really because you'd match. Like, even if somebody was stupid enough to offer him, like, five years at, like, eight and a half, you, you'd match that. You'd find a way to do it. Yeah. Even if it was $10 million, you'd find a way. It's just you'd be flipping off uh, the other team. <laughs> honestly, at $10 million, I'd rather take the, what, four first? Uh, no, it'd only be a fir- first, second, and third, I do believe. It's at like, 10 Huh. Yeah, it's ten and a half that okay. plus that, so... You know, a team could be a dick and do that. And, you know, I I think Kachuk's valuable enough to us where you'd match that. You'd just be extremely angry with both the player and the other team. Yeah. Of all of these deals, the Kachuk one is the one I can see going late into the summer. I wouldn't be surprised if Kachuk doesn't get signed until opening day of camp. Yeah, I agree. Uh, And the last one here, probably to me, the most unknown is David Riddick. This is a guy who, while he was a great goalie for us, he's still not not even played 100 NHL games. Um, you know, looked good for one season, was kind of shaky the year before. Um, if we look at his stats last year, he played 45 total games last year. What do you give the goalie? Uh, looking at some of the other comparables, I think two years at like two, two and a quarter would make sense. Because, like, he didn't have really good stats this year. No. Like, uh, for the full course of the season, you know, like, he did have a good stretch, which, yay, awesome, great for you, but, you know, everybody has good stretches every once in a while, it's just, you have to be consistent throughout the season, and he wasn't, and, you know, like, he's still a backup. Yep. And, and I think $2 million for a guy who's played even less than, you know, a hundred games is still pretty rich for a backup. I wouldn't go any higher than that. I'm hoping we can get him for about a million and a half. And I don't want to go any more than two years. Cause we've got a lot of young goalies knocking on the door and I don't want to be hamstrung. Yeah. Cause like a two sixty one goals against a nine eleven save percentage is not really anything to write home about. No. It, you know, like that's average backup numbers. Like, you know, and, he was playing behind one of the best teams in the league. Like his numbers should have even been better than that. So, you know, like I look at, uh, what, uh, the guy for Pittsburgh is back up, uh, Tristan Jari. No, the other guy, uh, to Casey or something like oh, that. Yeah. Uh, he only got like a million and a half. And I think that, that I, would that's be... a pretty reasonable comparable. If you're looking for a comparable. Yeah. That I think that's more in the ballpark. He could go two, two and a half, but I don't see it. Casey to Smith. There you go. One point two five for three years. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's probably a pretty good comparable. We'll um, see. Like, I'm not. Like, I think the Flames need to upgrade the goaltending, regardless. And you know, if Riddick plays at the elite level next year awesome but he could just be a all right backup so we'll and then we looking have... at looking at our ufas here i'll go through them all at once tell me if there's anyone you think we'll keep i i agree before we move on i think he could be an all right backup but you can't look at riddick right now as being the starter coming in next year no uh your boy garnet hathaway oscar fantenberg dalton prout and mike smith the four key ufas do you see any of them sticking around I'd like to keep Hathaway one and a half, I think would be 
as much as I'd go. I, I honestly wouldn't pay Hathaway more than a million at this point. I think there's enough UFAs you could replace him with, and I think he'll probably price himself out of our market. Yeah, I'd be fine, it, like, upwards of a million and a half, though, like, a, on a two- or three-year deal. And that's, you're paying the UFA premium, and I could see him getting even more than that from some team. What about Fantenberg or Prout on the blue line? I don't think Fantenberg would want to be back just because you look at the numbers and, yeah, you're behind. You're going to be seven or eight, yeah. Prout, I could see being back just because, hey, I get a job. So I can see for both Fantenberg and Prout going out shopping around, I could see one or both coming back in late July, early August if there's no suitors. Yeah, and I, I think that there's about 15 teams that would want Fantenberg yeah, to I be agree. like their their five six, so I'm I'm expecting him to be gone. I'd and like to have him back because I do like him as a defenseman and would be perfectly fine having him here as the number six seven. But I just don't see him wanting to come back. There's here. also a lot of guys that are UFA that you could fill that spot with. True. And then what about uh, Mike Smith? No, please no. Don't want him back at all. I think Smitty will have an NHL job. I don't think he'll have agree. an NHL job in Calgary. I think he'll be one of those guys as a training camp invitee for some team. And I think someone who, say, their goalie gets hurt in the offseason, Smith will be the guy. Or as a high-quality backup. Like, sort of like... Uh, well, that's kind of what I mean. Miller. Like, he'll be the guy yeah. for your backup. Yeah, like Ryan Miller uh, going to Anaheim a couple of years ago. I don't think that he'll get a starting job next year. No, I think that like some team will bring him in to be the high quality backup, and you know, it, uh, there's a, probably ten teams that would be interested in Smith as, in that role. I just don't see Calgary having the need to bring him back. Agreed. I'll be. I know they like him here, but I will be shocked and a little upset if they bring him back. It to me means that the position you have to address the most, you did nothing with. Yeah, exactly. Like. To me, goaltending was one of the main reasons why the Flames had as many problems as they did throughout the season. And, like, why, like, the end of the season was a little bit more hectic than it needed to be. And, like, we need NHL goaltending, and for a good portion of it, we weren't getting it. So, like, we just simply need to get other people in. Well, let's talk about that. So July 1st uh, will be the start of free agency, as always. And the Calgary Flames, like anyone else, has the opportunity to go shopping. Matt, would you agree with me that I think the number one place the team needs to be shopping this year is uh, upgrading a net? Yeah, definitely. There's some other like, pieces we... that if we can get them, great. But I think that's the one piece that we have to go shopping for. Yeah, like if you can get a second line right winger like a Gustav Nyquist, hey, awesome, great. But if you walk away with nothing but one position, we definitely need a goaltender. As of right now, according to this season's salary cap, the Flames have 12, almost $13 million in space after some contracts come off. So they're going to have some money to go shopping with, but not a lot after paying Kachuk. Uh, let's jump into the goalies. Let's look at some of the goalies and see who we think the Flames might get. I'm going to take two names off the board right away if you're good with it. I don't think Bobrovsky or Varlamov come here. I think they're both priced out of the market. Yeah, and they're. Uh, I'm. With Varlamov, I wouldn't even really want him anyway. Um, if you could to... get him at his current cap hit of, uh, you know, 7.4, maybe, but I think this guy's going to yeah. get 8 or 9. Uh, and, yeah, I. Even if he was five, I wouldn't really... I, it'd be like, okay. oh, okay, yeah, sure, awesome. And I think but... whoever loses the Bobrovsky... Uh, or, sorry, you're talking Varlamov, yeah. Varlamov, I'd take... Sorry, Varlamov's current hit is 5-5. Five, five. Um, I wouldn't take him for that. I'd take him for maybe four. Um, yeah. Bobrovsky's the guy I was thinking of. He's uh, 7.4. I'd take Bob at 7.4. I think Bob's going to get 10. And whoever doesn't get Bob is going to overpay for Varlamov. Yeah, and I could see that. I think that Bobrovsky is likely going to head to Florida with Panarin. Um, but, yeah, I, I just... To me, I don't see the need. Uh, like, Varlamov, to me, like he wasn't really any different than Mike Smith this past season. And 
like other than the one year he won the Vesna trophy, like I haven't really ever been overly impressed with Varlamov. So like if he came here, it'd be like, okay, yeah, we got another filler goaltender like Elliot and Smith. Is that really gonna make a big deal? Not well, I don't know really. about you. I can't see any goalie on here. I think is more than a placeholder. Like I don't think there's anyone we're gonna look at as the next franchise goalie on this list. Yeah, the only guy that I lend a little bit more credence to would be uh, Cam Talbot, um, just because of the fact that he, he recently was good, and he was playing for Edmonton, and this past season sucked because thirty one, still a younger goalie. Um, Currently, is his uh, salary is four four million two hundred thousand, so four point two million, which I think is reasonable for where he's at. Even if we could get Talbot at four five, I'd be very comfortable with that. Yeah, and like I, there are some other names like Mrazek. He's okay. Uh, I Leonard. I don't think he he's going anywhere. You know, like everybody else, it's like. So there's a guy that you and I talked about early in the season, and that was Keith Kincaid. I wouldn't want to bring him in as a number one, but and see, this is the thing. I'm I personally am more comfortable with Kincaid than Riddick, but I don't think the Flames want to give up on Riddick. No, and like realistically, the Flames could just run with Gillies and Riddick, and you know, wait and see how they do at training camp and. Then sign the veteran guy if But by be. then, the only guy that will be available is Brian Elliott. Which, yeah. It, Another it, guy, again, that I like, but not as the uh, starter, but if we were looking for a good, you know, young goalie, would be Jonas Corpusalo. Yeah, and I think he's going to be taking over the starting job in Columbus, so it it's really slim 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 pickings and i don't really see there being any easy easy way there's of a lot going of good backups it. on this list if we look at guys like ward elliot newverth johnson Mrazek, kincaid you know budai montoya niemi um you know there's a lot of guys that if you're just looking for a backup goaltender you'll fill that no problem there's no high-end goalies that are within our price range, and that's why I almost think Cam Talbot's the only real option. Yeah, and that's why I'm defaulting to him. There are other options via trade, but yeah, uh, I don't know. I think the Calgary Flames are going to target Talbot, though I could totally see, just knowing how things might shake down, either New Verth or Morazic being brought in as a 1A, 1B is sort of the second choice. Yeah. You know, I don't know what you think, but I think they would rather get a guy like that than have to, you know, rely on, say, you know, Gillies Riddick. Yeah. It just depends on price tag more than anything. But I yeah, think they're going to well, I mean, target something. And if you look at, you know, Mrazek's making a million and a half, New Verth is making 2.5, I think he'll go down. Um, you know, there's guys that are in here that, yeah, there's no there's no goalie I'll look at and go, this is a sleeper guy, take this guy. Um, yeah. You know, and there's not that level, you and I talked about them a couple of years ago, of the, you know, at the time I thought the Scott Darling, the, um, you know, Anti Ranta, the backup who is poised to break out. I don't see that in this list. Yeah, Morazic would probably be the closest for that. Corpus Salo is the closest, I think, but he's going to get paid. Yeah, like there's not really a ton. No. I think Morazic would probably be the tops on that list. And him and Talbot, I think, would be the only two that the Flames would be seriously talking to. I'm worried we might end up with New Verth just out of he's the only guy left, and that would worry me. Yeah. That'd be like, oh, great. We're right back where we, we started last season. Yeah. So, so, yeah. But, yeah, I'm I'm thinking when the dust settles, uh, Talbot will be here. Same here. So that, to me, is the biggest position we need to target. Um, would you be doing any big-name defenseman shopping? Uh, not more selling than anything. Yeah, I think right now, if you're looking for a defenseman, you're looking to fill that number six or seven role. And you can do that, you know, August 1st. Yeah. 
So, Matt, uh, goaltending, definitely we need an upgrade on. I think we'd both agree we need to subtract more than we need to add a defenseman at this point. Yeah, and even up front, like, unless the Flames can find a legitimate second-line winger, I don't really see there being any real need up front either. I think that there's going to be, not from the Flames, but I think there's going to be a lot of defensemen signed to really silly money this season. Um, yeah. And that's where you may get somebody who, who calls the Flames, right? like you were saying, in the week before July 1st and says, hey, we want Brody because he's got a great contract and that's all we can afford. Yeah, and I could see that because there's more forwards available this year as well. Yeah. So, like, you know, like um, one thought I heard was uh, Brody for Max Domi. And I could see something along those lines working especially if uh, Montreal might be able to land a forward to replace Domi instead. So, you know. If the Flames are going to try and trade a big piece like Brody, and you and I have talked about this, there's no team that really has one to give up, but I'd like them to try and target a goalie, which I don't think is going to happen because who wants to give theirs up at this point? Um, but, yeah, I could see doing doing that sort of a depth forward guy like Domi. Yeah. It. There's lots of options available, and we'll see. This uh, team, though, has a bad track record of forwards on July 1st. We had the Brower deal. We had the Neal deal. I almost want um, Tree to just go get a goalie and wait till July 3rd to pick up a forward. You see, like, the thing is, is that you can't really fault for living for James Neal. Like, he got hurt in training yeah uh, for and, the I season. Still, and i still i still think neil could bounce back next year yeah like if neil because like he had a long off season if he plays well or pra- trains well and doesn't have any freak injuries that especially ad- abdominal injuries which is what he had like those are hard to come back from and it doesn't matter what player you are and especially when you're just starting to train and then you don't really get the ability to train until training camp like that it screws you up and so it explains a lot of why neil was so bad for so long last year and if he can manage to have a proper off season and come back fresh i wouldn't be shocked if he's bounces back to the real deal instead of the great value james neil or as I was saying to people before the draft, if the Flames can't trade him, does that make him the no deal James Neal? Yeah. Um I, I I'm not as like worried I, about Neal as like I would if you I'm know, not like, so much worried like, about Neal, I just don't want to sign another player to that type of contract. Yeah. There, there's only really one guy that I really like in the UFA market for forwards, and that's Gustav Nyquist. And, I was gonna ask you about him because you mentioned him last year. Yeah, and five him, five though, and I think he's going to get paid. Yeah, and I wouldn't even be opposed to that. It's just I don't think we have that money though, Matt. Well, if they can make some deals like say moving Stone and for a leak, which I think that that you could move those contracts. So looking at the free agents that are available, I think we can, and the ones that would fall to you know the Flames budget, I think we could do better through trade of Brody and something else. I agree. It, 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 this is more than most years is a bit of a there's a lot of high air. end talent this year yeah it everything's just a little up in the air because there's a lot of middling guys that are available and yet not a ton and it's just it, it's frustrating for a lot of teams i'm and i'm gonna be sure like especially on july 1st that there's only like about a dozen guys that are like higher end and you know there's only x number of teams that can go and sign them and you know if you're not one of the lucky teams like you're still gonna want to fill the holes that are in your roster and you know you're you're gonna be kind of in tough like you look at uh winnipeg like they're gonna be kind of screwed because like they lost truba they replaced them with Pionk, which, okay, yeah, I guess that's replacing them. But they're also losing Tyre Myers. And, like, they don't really have anything to replace them with. So, you know, unless they can entice one of the other defensemen to come, then they're going to be in tough. And I don't see there being a ton of upside with any of the remaining guys either. So, 
you know, you've mentioned it, in the past Justin Williams is a forward. Got 53 points last year at 37. I wouldn't pay him the four million he's getting now, but if you get him for half that, would you bring him in? Even if you got him for three, awesome, come aboard. Um, one guy I could see sort of falling through the cracks a little bit, and I would be okay to bring in would be Matt Zuccarello. Yeah, that wouldn't be a bad idea either. I like Zuc Zuccarello. Zuccarello's 31. He's making 4.5 right now. I can see him sort of with all, like you said, all the teams are going to need somebody. I think somebody's going to unwrite. They shouldn't, but I think someone's going to overpay Simmons. I think um, just because of where they are, I could see a guy like um, Gustav Nyquist get overpaid. I could see Marcus Johansson get overpaid. Like, I think there's a lot of guys in there that you might see Zuccarello sort of fall down and not have a contract on the third, and that's a guy I'd be interested in looking at. Yeah. There's another one guy that I'd like the Flames to target, and I don't see how he comes unless it's $7 million, Who's that? And that's Anders Lee. Interesting choice. Uh, I've liked him since uh, he was in college, and yeah, I don't see how they get him for less than seven. But you know, it, that would be another interesting option if Anders they can move Lee, out. Twenty eight right now with uh, New York Islanders. He got fifty one games or fifty one points in eighty two games last year. Yeah, twenty eight goals. He's been a reliable forward. He had forty goals the year prior. 34 the year before that so like he's a very much a scorer um he's more of a left winger but he can play center and you know he would be a good second line center if the flames could snag him but again what? i do that would require the flames moving out a good portion of salary though in order yeah. to do that one guy that I could see end up here, and he was hurt for most of last year, so I can see him, again, not getting a big contract. Not saying I want him, but I could see the Flames doing it. would be Nico Strum. Yeah. Like, if they're looking for a cheap forward, I could see them bringing him in on a one-year. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of guys, really, that yeah. you could throw a one-year even, at. And... Even at that point, I'd even uh, target Jonas Donskoy if they don't re-sign him in San Jose. Yeah, or a guy like Ponick. Yeah, I mean, D Donskoy, Ar uh, Armia, Dezingle, there's a whole bunch of guys sort of in that area who I think, uh, you know, you could bring in for depth. Yeah, like, if you're expecting and penciling in Neil to elevate his game and be a second-line forward again, you could go with one of those depth guys to replace Neil on the third line. You could go that route. It it just like everything it just depends on who's willing to sign here how much they're asking and all that kind of stuff that because that this is the weird part of this particular off season is that there, you could go one of about a dozen different ways and it just depends on the who's the what's and the how and Calgary is fortunate that they don't really like if they just sat on their hands and really didn't do a damn thing they'd be perfectly fine it's just that you know if you can nibble at the edges and improve your team to make it more well-rounded awesome. I don't think they'll sit and do nothing but I can see them not doing a big free agent and instead doing a big trade I agree I, okay. I'm more leaning towards the trade market than the the free agent signing. But I think if they stay with their players the way they are right now, they're not in as good a position for next year. But if you can move, say, Brody for a forward, now you could get what you need without paying the free agent premium. Yeah, it just everything depends, and like that's why like between now and like when we record next, we'll have a a lot greater of an idea. It. A lot of it's just the randomness of what happens with other teams, frankly. And, you know, like, you look at teams like Winnipeg and Montreal, they desperately need defensemen, and if they can't get any of the UFAs to sign with them, then they're de going to be desperate to get somebody to play on the blue line, and that would facilitate a trade. It's just... Like everything, it just depends, really, on everybody else. And Matt, any interest in uh, Corey Perry? Oh, I'd like the Flames to sign Corey Perry. Just for the friendship tour. You know, having Kachuk with Perry and Bennett. like Perry just Neil. got a lot of money to go away. And we, 
a comparable list in Flames terms was when we brought in Bertuzzi for almost nothing after he got paid to go away. Like, if you could get Perry for $2 million or less, I'd seriously consider bringing him in. Oh, I'd be thrilled if we got Corey Perry. Like, I, I don't think know, he's a... I don't think he's a top six guy, but as a bottom six, I could, I think he'd be a huge asset here. Yeah, throw him on the power play with on the second power play unit and kind of shelter his even strength minutes and just have him there just to be Corey Perry. And, you know, that would... Calgary needs more dirt bags, and, you know, he's the best that's available. And there's only, like... Th- four guys that I'd consider true dirt bags in the NHL. We already have Kachuk. You know, his brother's another one, Marshan's one, and Perry's the other one. So, you know, if we could manage to get Perry, like I'd be all for that. We and could And I think definitely you could use play him. him a you could I think you could play him in a very different role here and take a lot of that pressure off. You're not gonna look at him to be the top offensive threat or even the top playmaker. No, like you could throw him on the second or third line and have Neil on the second or third line, like interchange them because they're both right wingers. And, you know, one will play with Sam Bannett and be a pain to play with. And the other will, will be with Kachuk and it will be a pain to play with. So, you know, like you're going to have two real disturbers on each line. Because Neil plays a lot of the same way as Perry does. Like, you could make the Flames a really, really annoying team to play against if you sign Corey Perry. And frankly, I think that he would... How much would you be willing to give for him? Three and a half, four. Like, you know, if need be. Like, I don't... I think that he, more than anyone, gets to pick where he plays. And because of the fact that the Flames were the best team in the West and could use him, I I think that we would be a good fit for him because he did say he wants to go and win another Stanley Cup. So, you know, and we do have the finances to actually pay him. So, you know, it would be a good fit overall. I think you get into a really dangerous precedent of starting to pay your bottom six guys three and a half, four. I think if, if we're saying that we're not going to pay Bennett more than, you know, two, five, I think you can't pay Perry much more than that either. Well, it, yeah, it like everything, it depends. And like if, you know, you, I, you say I, that I a don't. Lot. What does it depend on for you? Uh, like if the Flames can clear Stone's contract, then, you know, paying Perry, like I wouldn't expect signing him for more than a one year deal, frankly. Um, no, I think at 34 and a guy who's hurt, you get, you get one year. Yeah. And, like if the flames can shed salary and in order to pay Perry a little more to get him to sign here. Sure. But you know, it, yeah, it just, there, uh, there's a dangerous precedent though, to shed salary, to get a guy in for one year. Like that's not how you build a team. Well, the flames are going to need to shed salary anyway. And like, if they shed salary and he happens to come in. Yeah. But I wouldn't want to shed salary to overpay Perry. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see. Right? Like, there's, a, there's a difference between those two. Yeah. I know. It. If we, like, to me, if we shed salary, we get Kachuk done, we get Riddick done, we get Bennett done, and we got some money, sure, let's let's go after Perry. But I don't think you sacrifice any current forward for Perry. No. But, you know, if you can get him as, like, the cherry on top... Then. And and you're saying he wants to win a cup, and I could definitely see why he might want to come to Calgary, but I could also see uh, him wanting to go to a team where he feels he might be a top six guy too. So that'll be interesting which, to see. Yeah, which would also potentially be Calgary because you know the second line right winger spot is open. I think if business, you're looking so. around at teams that have uh, you know a t- a need in that spot, I don't know that I would. I think there's other Western teams that might have a bigger need there. Yeah. Yes and no. Uh, it, the, you know, Perry could realistically sign with like five different teams mm-hmm. and it would make sense in the West and another four or five in the East. So one guy, just, one guy yeah. I think it's overpaid. And 
if you could get him at less than three five, I know you would wouldn't agree, but I would go after Simmons at less than three five. Um, he's going to get overpaid. A guy I could see who could fall, and not saying I want him would be Spezza. Um, any interest in either one of those guys? Uh, Spezza wouldn't be a terrible idea. What do you um, think he's worth? He's thirty six. Yeah, yeah. He did only have twenty seven points last year with Dallas. Like You'd, that's not... that, that's why I think you know he's probably going to not sign July first. If you can get him for two and a half on a one yeah. year, it's probably worth doing. But I don't think he's going to fall that low. I think there's team like Edmonton that would overpay him. Yeah, or Vancouver. I, yeah, I think insert random rebuilding club. Like I, I actually would kind of expect him to go back to Ottawa, frankly. Yeah, we'll just see. A, just as like the retirement tour kind of thing, and Ottawa could use some leadership and that. Um, but yeah, I mean, like you said, there's not a ton of there's the high end guys, you know. There's the uh, Duchesnes, the the you know Pavelskis, the Panarins. But in terms of second tier guys, just like with the goalie market, it's flooded with a lot of guys where you can go in a lot of different directions. Yeah, and that's the that it's gonna be a bizarre. Like, this is biz more bizarre than most years, frankly. Well, like, I think the cap is the thing that's going to make it really bizarre, is they don't have as much money to play with as the GM's expected. So I think you may not see the huge frenzy that we usually do July 1st. Yeah, like, if the players had opted to use, like, the escalator like they normally do, the cap would have been actually $85 million. And then that's it, what most GMs were budgeting for. Yeah, like, somewhere in the 83 84 range, and... You know, when you're getting 81 and a half, like, oh, great, we don't have any cap. And well, I like mean, if you, if you look at that realistically, three and a half doesn't sound like a lot, three and a half million, but that is a middle six forward or probably, a, you know, three, four defenseman. Yeah, like that's Derek Ryan, you know, at, at plus a bit. Yeah. But, you know, like that's a high quality depth player worth that's not available to you and like i'm sure that a lot of players are going to be trying to sign right away to try and bank the money and that they can and yeah it, it's gonna be a I, like i'm expecting a lot more like tr training camp walk-ons more than anything um, i'm, a, I'm expecting year. that we're gonna probably see a few of the big names like the bobrovskis like the panarin sign on the first and i think there's gonna be a lot of guys and their agents who have to readjust their ask and we don't see those deals get done till late in the first or or early on the second yeah or even into like the middle of the month i don't think it'll take that long i think there's gonna be you know a couple million dollars between a team and a player and they'll just get it done you know right away yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't even be shocked if a couple players didn't go over to the K this year just because, you know, there's no I, I think the guys that would go over there would be like the Matt Molsons or the Spezzas, the guys that are in their late 30s, the Justin Williams, who are, you know, 35, 36, 37, know they're probably not going to get the NHL work but could work over there. I think if you're a 31, you know, 32-year-old, you could shoot yourself in the foot for being able to come back. Sure. But, yeah, I could definitely see, like, a guy like Matt Molson, I could see head over to Europe. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Any interest in the Flames going after any offer sheets? Um, we're obviously not going to be able to afford Mitch Marner, but are there any other guys you think it's worth uh, trying to steal as an RFA? Not really. Like, Marner would pretty much be the only guy that I'd consider worth. You know, and Kachuk, but he's ours, so, you know, that kind of... <laughs> I think on the RFA front, we got to get our own business done and not worry about other people. Yeah. And realistically, there's not too many teams that could afford Marner anyway. No. So it's that kind of limits things. Yeah, I think Toronto will find a way, just like we would with Kachuk. Toronto would find a way to match whatever offers yeah. put out there. Yeah. Well, Matt, I think that pretty much wraps up our uh, draft recap and uh ufa day what what do we do we have a name for july 1st ufa day canada free, day <laughs> free agency day I, I don't know um but whatever it is our look ahead to that and we will talk to everybody again uh the first week of july when the rookie camp is taking place at wind sport right now that's set for the fourth through the seventh uh is our guests they have ice booked a few days around that but we guess they'll be on the ice fourth fifth sixth seventh 
Check the Flames website for info, but usually on the last day, so the Sunday, there's a scrimmage. So if you want to see some of the players like uh, Jacob Peltier, Dustin Wolf, some of these new guys, come down to the scrimmage. And if you see us there, say hi. But uh, that'll be when you and I will look back at the aftermath of July 1st. Yep. And it'll be interesting to see what happens. I'm expecting whatever was going to happen today will happen between now and then. It's just we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, before we go, this will be the last time we'll remind everybody because after the training camp, we're going to make the draw. If you haven't yet, please go to firesidechat.ca slash survey and fill our listener survey. We do this once a year. It's a way for you guys to give us feedback on the show. Let us know what you like, maybe some things you'd want to see changed or done differently. And Matt and I take those to heart. We'll read them over the summer and we will see if we can make some adjustments to make the show more along what you guys are looking for for next year. If at the end of the survey you give us your name and email, you don't have to, but if you decide you want to do that, uh, we'll enter you into a draw for a Flames prize pack, and there's some Flame stuff, there's some Fireside Chat stuff. I think we have a T-shirt and a, a toque for Fireside Chat and some coasters. We actually have one of the uh, playoff um, towels that we got a hand, uh, hold of that's going to go in there, and I think we may have a number 12 retirement t-shirt but i can't promise that yet so a bunch of really cool goodies uh that we've been able to get a hold of so if you want to leave your name and email not required but if you do you'll be entering that draw otherwise you can just submit anonymously if you want to and uh, we look forward to reading your feedback so matt you enjoy canada day i don't know if you're gonna be sitting in front of the tv all day or if you have other things to do just uh looking forward really to the development camp and seeing how things shake out in the next few days and Doing more yard work. Yay, excitement. You're, you're not going to be sitting on your couch on July 1st watching to see whose name comes up? No, I'm going to be painting lumber because that's exciting. <laughs> you know, it's like trade deadline day. I don't know how you can sit there all day. Like, these guys are filling time because not much is going to happen. To me, I can listen to the radio or I can check my phone every 20 minutes to see who goes where. There's not much to see when you watch it on TV. No, it's like, give me the headlines for like what happened, what the picks were, or whatever. Switched hands. Okay, great. Awesome. That's all I need to know. Like I know what all the players are, so you know I don't really need much beyond that. Well, Matt, I think that's about it for us. I will talk to you around July 4th. Yeah. Congratulations, Giordano, for winning the Norris. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.